And I and, and I want to say what's happening today on the ground with CARICOM is also a problem because back in 2004, PJ Patterson, who was the leader, who was in the who was the president of CARICOM, was very much against the removal of Haiti's sitting president. In fact, he refused to acknowledge the the impulse um, uh, government that the U.S. put on us. Um, and um, and and but now CARICOM is playing a different role, where they're bringing the U.S., France, and Canada, the the people who did the original sin, to pick our leaders again. And so. We acknowledge the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry upon the establishment of a transitional presidential council and the naming of an interim prime minister. We have to go back and understand that the, the root of this crisis is not last week, it's not this week, it's not even Ariel Henry, but we have to go back to 2004 with the coup d'etat. The council will exercise specified presidential authorities during the transition operating by majority vote. The exclusion from the Transitional Presidential Council of anyone who is currently on a charge, indictment, or has been convicted in any jurisdiction, anyone who is under UN sanction, anyone who intends to run in the next election in Haiti, anyone who opposes the UN Security Council Resolution 2699. 2004, um, as has been revealed and admitted to, the U.S., France, and Canada got together and backed a coup d'etat against the, the country's first democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Jean Aristide. Um, and the U.S. Marines flew into his home, put him on a plane um, with his security officials, his, his, his wife, and aide, and flew them to the Central African Republic. And people... Haitians deserve a country where children can go to school and their parents know they will be safe. We commend the willingness and courage of Haitian stakeholders to commit to put Haiti back on a path towards democracy, stability, and prosperity. And in the WikiLeaks papers revealed to us uh, late, uh, later that Hillary Clinton actually flew to Haiti and changed the election results where um, Michel Martelly of the PHTK political party did not make the first round, but the U.S. forced um, the, the Haitian Election Council to actually make him, put him in the final, in the second round. And so establishing the PH, PHTK, Michel Martelly, a, a neo devalierist as Haiti's president with under 20% of the people voting, with the largest um, political party in, party in Haiti, La Balas, not being able to participate. We set the stage for what we see today. So oh, you still didn't get your ticket? This flight takes off every single day. Tap that subscription button. Thanks. To discuss the multidimensional crisis in Haiti. This meeting followed a series of discussions over a period of time, including those facilitated by the Eminent Persons Group, which engaged a wide, wide range of actors, including Haitian politicians, political parties, the religious community, private sector, the diaspora, and civil society. We are pleased to announce the commitment to a transitional governance arrangement which paves the way for a peaceful transition of power, continuity of governance, an action plan for near-term security, and the road to free and fair elections. It further seeks to assure that Haiti will be governed by the rule of law. This commitment reflects hard compromises among a diverse coalition of actors who have put their country above all differences. To that end, we acknowledge the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry upon the establishment of a transitional presidential council and the naming of an interim Prime Minister. I want to pause and thank Prime Minister Henry for his service to Haiti, his service to the Haitian people, and, her, and for his personal commitment for the furtherance of the development of Haiti and the advancement of the people of Haiti, and I ask us to give him an applause. And the following is agreed. The creation of a transitional presidential council 
comprised of seven voting members and two non-voting observers. The seven voting members will comprise one representative from each of the following groups. Collective, December 21st, EDE slash Red, Lavalas, Montana, Petit Dissolin, and the private sector. The non-voting members will be, will be represented by one member from civil society and one member of the interfaith community. The council will exercise specified presidential authorities during the transition, operating by majority vote. The exclusion from the transitional presidential council of anyone who is currently on a charge, indictment, or has been convicted in any jurisdiction. Anyone who is under UN sanction. Anyone who intends to run in the next election in Haiti. Anyone who opposes the UN Security Council Resolution 2699. The Transitional Presidential Council will swiftly select and appoint an interim Prime Minister. The Transitional Presidential Council will, together with the interim Prime Minister, appoint an, an inclusive Council of Ministers. The Transitional Presidential Council will hold the relevant and possible powers of the Haitian Presidency during the transition period until an elected government is established. The Transitional Presidential Council will undertake the following. Appoint an inclusive Council of Ministers, co-sign the orders, decrees and to sign off on the agenda of the Council of Ministers, set the essential criteria for the selection of an impartial provisional electoral council and establish the provisional electoral council. Make arrangement for a peaceful transition, ensure continuity of governance and establish a national security council. Continue collaboration with all members of the international community for the accelerated deployment of the, of the multinational security support mission authorized by UNSCR 2699 stroke 2023. It is agreed that the implementation of these measures will be con concluded in parallel. The parties also make specific individual commitments regarding principles of inclusion, integrity, restoration of peace, and orderly transition of power. These shared and individual commitments can represent important steps towards facilitating increased humanitarian access to help ease the suffering of the Haitian people. The international community stands ready to partner with Haiti to achieve these goals. Haitian participants must now fully implement their commitments. Haitians deserve a country where children can go to school and their parents know they will be safe. We commend the willingness and courage of Haitian stakeholders to commit to put Haiti back on a path towards democracy, stability, and prosperity. With a framework in place that illuminates a path forward, it is incumbent upon all Haitians to give the agreement a chance to work. And we implore all parties, all stakeholders, all Haitians to be patient. This process requires patience. Let us be patient. Let us give a bit. Let us sacrifice a bit and give this agreement a chance to work, to enter into a process of national dialogue and to lay the groundwork for a transition that is based on inclusivity, encourages participation by all stakeholders and paves the way for elections as soon as possible. This is the only sustainable path to a future of strong democratic institutions, peaceful resolution of conflict, and security and prosperity of all Haitians. Let me also at this time thank Ambassador Rotre of the UN, who is also the Chief of the Cabinet of the Secretary General. And CARICOM owes, CARICOM owes Professor Grandison a depth of gratitude for his selfless service. One love, Delta 9 family.
Welcome back to the flight. Now, if this is your first time flying with us, do remember to hit that subscription button on your way in so that you can stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Now, today we're talking about Haiti. Today we're talking about the foundation of the so-called Caribbean. Today we're talking about the foundation of independence in the Caribbean. Today we're talking about a country that played such a pivotal part in independence that if they didn't walk from one end of the island to the other end of the island, taking what's rightfully theirs in blood, we wouldn't know the freedom that we know right now. And at this very moment, their country has been taken over. Their country is no longer functioning under a governing body elected by the citizens of that country. Right now, the core foundation or the core organization, whatever they name themselves, and the United Nations is running Haiti. After they would have invaded them 20 years ago, you're right, 20 years ago in 2004, it took them 20 years to topple this country. I know you heard that intro and the conversation of the international bodies and the powers that be that spoke earlier in this video. You heard their side of the information. You heard their story, their conversation, and their diplomatic, allegedly, their right or wrong approach that they're going to use to make sure, allegedly, that they benefit the most in this situation right here. And we got to ask ourselves, who are these governing bodies? Who is CARICOM? Who created that CARICOM governing body and the number of states and the members? Who is the original persons that was governing these so-called independent nations that are a part of CARICOM? Why is CARICOM so important in this process? It took them 20 years to topple Haiti and to get it into the state in which it is in right now. We heard the Polish information before. All the things that's going on wrong in the country, the way that the criminals allegedly have taken over the country and everything that's been infiltrated and all the guns, the bloodshed and all of that. But we got to ask ourselves how it started, how this originated, who are the foundation players in setting up this situation to be so? Why is Haiti the way that it is right now? Who are the persons playing both sides and making sure that Haiti can't move forward and can't see nothing better? unless they are the ones in control of it and all its wealth and resources. Yes, Haiti is very wealthy in, in resources. Yes, Haiti has a lot of mineral wealth, a lot of untapped mineral, mineral wealth that a lot of countries in the world are trying to get their hands on, just like Guyana just like Guyana and you're gonna hear the speaker that's coming up point out the differences in how the Caribbean is dealing with the situation now versus how they dealt with it before our president right now is the chairman of CARICOM and the person who's pretty much leading the team that is overseeing what's going on in Haiti now we gotta ask ourselves in history, in our history, do you as a citizen ever remember a time when Haitians were dealt with in a friendly and a cordial way in a large group in Guyana? 
think about it. I could be wrong. But I'm asking a question. I'm not trying to paint the picture here. We're going to hear both sides of this situation today. We're going to understand this whole conversation that we've been hearing back and forth in the media about Haiti and what's going on in that country. We're going to hear both sides. We hear the side from the president. We hear the side from CARICOM. We hear the side from the UN and the functioning bodies. But guess what we're going to hear? We're going to hear the side from a historian. We're going to hear the side from a person who's educated and well-versed and an authority in this situation. We're going to hear from a Haitian. We're going to hear from our brothers and sisters on the ground. We're going to hear from one of the sisters of the soil. And she's going to give you the information and the insights that you might not hear in your mainstream newscasts. Let's get right into what she has to say about this and what's going on in Haiti right now and the fact that the Prime Minister has stepped down and Haiti is now in control of the core group and the United Nations. Where fighting continues between police and armed groups calling for the resignation of the unelected Prime Minister Ariel Henry. Over the weekend, police and palace guards worked to retake some streets in the capital, Port-au-Prince, after armed gangs launched large-scale attacks on at least three police stations. Haiti's been under a state of emergency for the past week, with tens of thousands displaced amidst the fighting. UN officials are warning Haiti's health system is nearing collapse due to shortages of staff, equipment, and other resources to treat a growing number of wounded patients. Meanwhile, the U.S. military said Sunday it conducted an overnight mission to airlift non-essential U.S. staff out of Haiti and to boost security at the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince. Caribbean leaders issued a call late Friday for an emergency meeting today in Jamaica. They've invited the United States, France, Canada, the U.N. and Brazil to the meeting. CARICOM, the 15-nation Caribbean bloc, said in a statement, quote, the situation on the ground remains dire. Ariel Henry was appointed prime minister after the July 2021 assassination of President Jovenel Moïse. Henry still has not returned to Haiti after a trip to Kenya, where he was seeking a deal for a long-delayed UN-backed mission to Haiti. Kenya announced last year it would lead the force, but it has effectively been placed on hold. Henri arrived in Puerto Rico Tuesday after he was unable to land in the Dominican Republic, with the Dominican president saying Henri was not welcome in the country for safety reasons. For more, we're joined by Jemima Pierre, professor at the Social Justice Institute at the University of British Columbia in Canada and research associate at the University of Johannesburg. She's a Haitian-American scholar and co-coordinator of the Black Alliance for Peace's Haiti Americas team, which has been closely following the crisis in Haiti. A recent article for NACLA is headlined, Haiti as Empire's Laboratory. Professor Pierre, welcome back to, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you start off by describing what you understand is the latest on the ground who the armed groups are, um, and the different sectors of Haitian society that are joining together with those armed gangs and calling for the resignation of the elect unelected prime minister, Henri. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for having me, um, Amy. Um, I what, One of the things that we need to, to uh, just start off with is just these are paramilitary uh, forces. Um, uh, I, I think gangs is an ins insufficient name for them because a lot of them are former uh, military and former police officers, and they're heavily armed. Um, what's happening is a bunch of different groups coming together um, to to say, and they call themselves now Viva Sum, which is live together, a uh, bunch of uh, different various uh, various armed young groups, young men um, in groups to say that they want to get rid of Ayo Henri. Now, we hear that there are negotiations happening around the clock, um, and apparently there's supposed to be negotiations going on today, um, I think in Jamaica or by the CARICOM countries that include the U.S., France, and Canada. 
Um, the, the, the problem, though, is the fact that there are all these negotiations going on outside of Haiti by many foreigners with no main participation from the Haitian masses. And I think, you know, we have to go back and understand that the, the root of this crisis is not last week, it's not this week, it's not even I or Henri, but we have to go back to 2004 with the coup d'etat. So take us on that journey back. Um, if you'll give us the historical context uh, in your piece, uh, you, uh, it's headlined Haiti as Empire's Laboratory. In it, you write, Haiti has been and continues to be the main laboratory for U.S. imperial machinations in the region and throughout the world. Explain. Yes, definitely. You know, we say the, the crisis in Haiti is a crisis of imperialism. In 2004, um, as has been revealed and admitted to, the U.S., France, and Canada got together and backed a coup d'etat against the, the country's first democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Um, and the U.S. Marines flew into his home, put him on a plane um, with his security officials, his, his, his wife and aide, and flew them to the Central African Republic. And people can actually go to the Democracy Now! archives, <laughs> which covered this live. And I remember listening to this happening live. And, um, and the, the point of this was that this coup d'etat, which was led by two permanent members of the U.N. Security Council, was then sanctioned by the UN when these same two members of the UN Security Council, and that's the US and France, um, basically pushed the UN Security Council into sending a multinational um, military force to Haiti, um, an arm under Chapter 7 deployment. And that itself was illegal because the original, the original coup d'etat was illegal. The US ambassador to Haiti and the deputy ambassador were in the process, they're the ones that named who the interim um, a pri a president would be, put together a council of sages that basically restructured um, Haiti's elected president. And back then we had 7,000 um, elected officials. Today we have zero. And over time, I say Haiti has been under occupation because it is this military occupation, the minister occupation that went from 2004, uh, 2004 2007 that established the core group that it's an unelected group of western officials including brazil which led the military arm of the occupation in 2004 under lula which led then uh, the which has been controlling all the actions in haiti down to naming who the prime minister would be uh, uh, uh ario Henri after the assassination of jovenel moise i have to quickly say though one of the key things that happened is in 2010 after the earthquake in Haiti that killed hundreds of thousands, where the U.S. pushed the sitting president, um, René Preval, to have elections. And in the WikiLeaks papers revealed to us uh, late, uh, later that Hillary Clinton actually flew to Haiti and changed the election results, where um, Michel Martelly of the PHTK political party did not make the first round, but the U.S. forced um, the, the Haitian Election Council to actually make him put him in the final in the second round and so establishing the ph phdk michel martelly a, a neo devalierist as haiti's president with under 20 percent of the people voting with the largest um, political party in, party in haiti la balas not being able to participate we set the stage for what we see today so by the time we get to alia Henri being imposed on the haitian people by the core group we have no elected officials because michel martelly Basically, under him, we lost a lot of, uh, we, we didn't have many elections, and then he put in his protege, Jovenel Moise, who was also unpopular, and didn't run any elections. So we actually haven't had any elections in Haiti since 2016, when Jovenel Moise was, put, uh, was uh, selected for us by the core group. And so to understand what's going on in Haiti, we have to understand how the original moment of the 2004 coup d'etat led us to a, the complete destruction of the Haitian state. And if we don't do that, we don't understand these current flare-ups where people are saying they want their democracy back and saying that whatever negotiations that are happening outside of Haiti has nothing to do with them because it has not included them.
You know, when we went to the Central African Republic in a small plane uh, with U.S. Congress member Maxine Waters and the late founder of TransAfrica, Randall Robinson, and a Jamaican MP, um, we flew to the Central African Republic. They went to retrieve the Aristides, who'd been put there by the United States. And as we were flying back over the Atlantic, um, they got word um, from that but that Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, and Colin Powell were saying that the Aristides were not to return to this hemisphere, were not to return to Haiti, to which Randall Robinson replied, whose hemisphere? Um, and so he was not able to land in, in uh, Haiti and went into exile in South Africa, where you have also taught for many years, for over seven years. And then we went to uh, South Africa when he finally returned to, um, to Haiti. And people can see all of those reports at mm -hmm. democracynow.org. But <clears throat> I'm wondering, I wanted to um, talk about the latest news, the Miami Herald reporting that Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke by phone Thursday with Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry in a series of calls that officials described as tense. This is the U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller speaking Wednesday about the violence in Haiti. As the situation on the ground grows increasingly dire, we in CARICOM have continued to call on stakeholders, including the Prime Minister, to make concessions in the interest of the, the Haitian people. So <clears throat> we are not calling on him or pushing for him to resign, but we are urging him to expedite the transition to an empowered and inclusive governance structure that will move with urgency to help the country prepare for a multinational security support mission to address the security situation and pave the way for free and fair elections. But Jacqueline Charles, the Miami Herald reporter, said that the that um, the U.S. was pushing R.L. Henry to resign. What do you understand, Professor Pierre, about the latest, and also even where he is? Is he still in Puerto Rico, unable to get back to Haiti? Yeah, he's in Puerto Rico under. FBI uh, uh, protection. Um, he had to leave the hotel he was in when he first landed because Haitian um, Haitian uh, people living in Puerto Rico were protesting his presence in 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 the state, and so that's important. You know, the uh, the the U.S. government is is being extremely hypocritical here because in 2004, when the U.S. Marines landed at Aristide's house, put him on a plane. And, and told the world that he resigned before the plane even landed in, in, in Central African Republic and basically uh, put in power a whole new government. And now they're saying that this unelected prime minister that they put in place refuses to resign where he actually has no uh, legitimacy and no mandate whatsoever. I also want to say quickly, um, uh, just to touch back to the, the question earlier, is the reason I say Haiti is a laboratory, because this is the first coup d'etat that was sanctioned by the UN, and Haiti was ruled by a, a, a multilateral co coalition of all these countries. And so the UN uh, uh, occupation of Haiti on, through Minister and through the core group is multi multinational, multiracial, and it almost seems as if this is a humanitarian effort as opposed to a coup d'etat that has been uh, uh, successful. And so the whole world is participating in the occupation of Haiti unwittingly because and this is how we have to remember how the U.S. will work. And they will use their proxies to do the, the dirty work for them. And I, and, and I want to say what's happening today on the ground with CARICOM is also a problem because back in 2004, P.J. Patterson, who was the leader, who was, in the, who was the president of CARICOM, was very much against the removal of Haiti's sitting president. In fact, he refused to acknowledge the, the impulse um, uh, government that the U.S. put on us. Um, and, um, and, and But now CARICOM is playing a different role where they're bringing the U.S., France, and Canada, the, uh, the people who did the original sin, to pick our leaders again. And so the problem is, if this go goes on, and if they don't take into account other uh, uh, solutions that Haitians have been putting together, uh, you know, in 2000, early 2021, you had uh, La Famille Lavalas come up with Sali Public, which means that we need to start over uh, and, and, and change the system. We had the uh, Montana Accords. We have local uh, groups that actually had a solution before the Moise uh, assassination. The U.S. government was trying to protect Moise. 
and basically ignored all these local solutions. And so now they cannot say that they're here to help Haiti as much as trying to figure out how to put in place another unpopular and illegal government. And so then we'll have the same problem a few, uh, a few years down the line. The other thing I want to quickly say, I know in a hurry, is that the, the people funding these armed groups are the part of the oligarchy. And, um, and most of the guns and ammunition are coming from the U.S. People must remember that in the late 2022 and early 2023, the Canadian government sanctioned three of the, uh, the richest uh, oligarchs in Haiti. That's Gilbert Bijot, Reynold Deep, and Sharif Abdallah. The Canadian government also sanctioned former President Michel Martelly um, and other, and Laurent Lamont, his, his prime minister, all of them because they, for drug trafficking, but also for funding these, uh, these armed groups. And so in the news, we get, you get these guys that look, you know, like raggedy, ragged and poor, but then the people really funding them because Haiti does not manufacture guns are these elites that are, that are, that are, that are behind all the violence. And so I also want put, to put that um, in, into, into very clear context so that we know that this is a very complex problem that's very much set up by the, the 2004 coup, but also perpetuated by the oligarch and the U.S., which work together to keep Haiti unstable so that we can say Haiti's ungovernable and we need to come in and save it. 100% wildcrafted CMOS from nature by natives. Why pay more? This one is from Azadine Mohammed, right? This one's from Azadine Mohammed. He sued me and he, and he um, said, so I'm to make a public apology, right? Within um, seven days, right? What I got to tell you is Azadine Mohammed, right? I don't care how much money you get. Use Nagar. And if I dare know, you still got to call me. Yeah, son, got his life short. You're not going to live next one to the age. You still have to die. Don't come and trace it again. Memories, life is memories. Now you do is building a little more than me. You're gonna let Pony Arch build a little more than me.